A book from 1987 that I found in a public trash bin some years ago tells that MS-DOS was the industrial standard operating system of the time, but even today it is still in use. Hang on to see what you can do with it. Hello and welcome to this brand new video about some old stuff. Whenever you want to talk about personal computing, DOS might be a good place to start. So I'd like to start this channel by giving you an introduction to DOS. First of all, we're going to start talking a little bit about the history of DOS and after that, we want to look into how you can still use DOS nowadays. So let's start. In the early 1980s, IBM was looking for an operating system for their new line of personal computers. And they wanted someone for, to create the operating system for them. Luckily, Bill Gates' mother, Marianne Gates, served on the National Board of United Way. And who also served on this board was the CEO of IBM at that time. So after getting that little hint from uh, Bill Gates' mother, IBM got in touch with Bill Gates, the CEO of Microsoft at the time, and he convinced IBM that his company Microsoft could deliver the new software for IBM's personal computer. Bill Gates then bought an existing operating system called 86 DOS which is better known as QDOS for quick and dirty operating system. And he then adapted that system, QDOS, to run on the new IBM line of computers and he would call the resulting product Microsoft Disk Operating System, which was later known as MS-DOS. Microsoft refused to completely sell MS-DOS to IBM. They just wanted to license it over to IBM. So whenever IBM sold a personal computer with MS-DOS, they had to pay a licensing fee to Microsoft for each computer running MS-DOS. And IBM did that. They called MS-DOS PC-DOS when it was running on an IBM computer, but it basically was the same system. And the first release was on August 12, 1981. Microsoft would also license its product MS-DOS to multiple other computer manufacturers. And what that me meant basically is that whenever a computer running MS-DOS was sold, Microsoft was earning money. While as IBM wasn't rather profiting from that, uh, Microsoft did. Microsoft made a big profit on MS-DOS and by 1983 30% of all personal computers in the world would run on Microsoft software. So 1983 was only two years after the first release and they already have taken over 30% of all personal computers so that's really a lot. I would be very excited if this video was watched by 30% of YouTube population after two years uh, it has been ro ro rolled out. I think that's pretty unlikely though. <laughs> so now let's talk a little bit uh, about the later action that uh, happened to DOS and uh, the creation of Windows. In 1985, Windows 1.0 was released as a graphical user interface for DOS. So what that meant basically is that whenever you started up your computer, you would run DOS on it basically, but Windows was just more or less a program that you could start by typing in a command that would run this graphical user interface Windows. Since most of the programs were text-based back, back in the 80s, Windows wasn't a thing for a standalone 
operating system. If you only had Windows, which was relying on a mouse a lot, most programs would have run on that. And Windows actually was criticized for relying as much on the mouse as it did back in the days of 1985 for the first version. So I would say that in the 80s, Windows was rather a niche product and an add-on software to DOS than a standalone operating system. And actually, it took Windows 10 more years to come as the standalone fully graphical operating system as we know it today. But in 1995, Windows was still based on Microsoft DOS. All the Windows 9X versions, so Windows 95, Windows 98, and I think even Windows Millennium, came with DOS compatibility mode. That means that uh, in Windows, instead of shutting down your computer, you were still able to shut down your computer and reboot it into DOS, which didn't actually take very long. The reason for that is that Microsoft probably assumed that a lot of people were still owning DOS software and they wanted to run this DOS software in Windows. MS-DOS in Windows 95 was called version 7.0 and MS-DOS in Windows 98 was called MS-DOS 8.0. So those were the last MS-DOS versions. And Windows NT, which was also developed in the mid-90s, was independent from DOS, but still the 32-bit versions of it came with a subset of DOS emulation tools to run old DOS applications. So running DOS applications is, as you can see, uh, kind of a priority in the 1990s. Even in Windows Vista, you were still able to create a DOS-based startup disk right from the system. It wasn't possible in the later Windows 7 64-bit and uh, Windows 10 versions still. But as you can see, DOS was still kind of around until uh, 2005. The last release of the IBM version of DOS, which was called PC DOS 2000, was released in April 1998. Then in 2018, finally, years after the first DOS release, Microsoft released the source code for MS-DOS 1.25 and 2.0 on GitHub. So now you can finally look into the source code of a program that was rolled out in the very early 1980s. So let's look into DOS nowadays a little bit. MS-DOS is still in use on some computers, especially when there is no new software available for a purpose. So I know that some companies actually have a DOS computer standing around somewhere because there's one single program that they could only run on this DOS computer. And if it still works, why, why do something about it, you know? MS-DOS is also used for retro gaming and retro computing. And I'm not just talking about MS-DOS. A lot of DOS versions are still used for retro gaming and retro computing. And there are a lot of channels focusing on restoring old computers or doing some retro gaming. But I think there's not a lot of software tutorials around there for uh, using DOS. So I think that's a good thing to start with. Since DOS can run on low resources, it is very likely to be used on embedded systems or old computers. Even though if you create something new, I guess that a lot of people would start with uh, using a Raspberry Pi, which runs on a Debian-based Linux distribution called Raspbian. Um, but still, I mean, if you want to run a system on low resources, DOS is an option. 
if you want to play retro games on, uh, especially playing retro games on Windows, in DOSBox is pretty famous. But you can also use an open source version of DOS, like FreeDOS. And according to Google Trends, there are still some people searching for, say, MS-DOS or FreeDOS. So DOS is still in the minds of people nowadays. And people are still looking for DOS. So let's do a little rundown of the uses that we still have for DOS nowadays. In this picture, you can see a US Navy person using a computer running MS-DOS in order to do some food service management or to use a food service management system. Um, I got this photo from uh, Wikipedia. It's from the US Navy. It's taken in 2011. And as you can see, uh, the US Navy seems to be one of those environments that still occasionally uses MS-DOS to run legacy software on because it still works. So why replace it? So that, uh, that's our first purpose of using DOS nowadays, running legacy software. The other purpose is retro gaming and retro computing, as mentioned before. And especially to retro computing, I, I, I know that a lot of people who run old software like to, to be gaming on it. I do have this old portable computer standing around uh, in my house kind of as decoration. But whenever someone comes over who is familiar with DOS, this person oftentimes still likes to use this computer and play around a little bit and have this old look and feel of MS-DOS. Maybe uh, you are familiar with some kind of software that you have been using for years, like say Norton Commander or anything, and you just kind of want to see that again. Um, a lot of people tell me that uh, since DOS was a pretty minimalistic operating system, it felt like uh, using a radio. You just had to turn the computer on, it would boot pretty fast, and you can, sh can just start using it. People start to miss that feeling, and I think that's part of why retro computing and uh, restoration of old computers is so famous nowadays. You can also use it to run on low resources, um, especially if you have older hardware. A lot of people like to keep their old computer just as a, as a memory, I would say. And then it's an amazing thing if you can still use it with a kind of modern software. And when talking about modern software, I'm obviously not talking about the old MS-DOS, I'm talking about FreeDOS which will be one of our next topics. So here yeah, I want to, but, but before we do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about what DOS is in a technical sense. First of all, it's a single tasking hours, which just means that you can only run one single program at a time. Even though you could maybe argue that there is some kind of possibility to run something in the background it's not a multitasking operating system as we are used to nowadays, where you could uh, say write an email and watch a YouTube video and look into your task manager at the same time and in the same screen. That's just not possible on DOS. On DOS, you always have just one program op it's one program opened, and you will have to focus on that. It's single user. Actually, there's not even any kind of user in DOS. Uh, whenever you boot up your computer, it will instantly ask you to type in a command without even asking you to type in any kind of credentials. And if you are into that command prompt, you basically always have full privileges over the whole machine which means that you can easily de delete system files and you can easily delete uh, the whole system or you could easily destroy something in the system. And that's what it makes so kind of 
insecure in a, in, a, in some sense. In the image that I've uh, that, I, that I'm using on this slide, you can see uh, the vector graphic showing you a very old computer, and this computer has a lock right next to the power key of it. And the purpose of this lock was to prevent the computer from being booted or to prevent the, the disk drives from being used just in order to have some kind of security. Otherwise, anyone who had physical access to the machine would be able to just press the power button and type any comment that you want to. So that's that's kind of dangerous. And as you can imagine, the, the, the this lock was the only layer of security you had back then when DOS was the main operating system. So even though that made uh, using a computer as easy as using a radio, uh, it still came with some kind of downsides. You should always remember when uh, being in the DOS command prompt that this is kind of comparable with being in the common prompt of Windows as an administrator or running a root console in Linux which just means that you could destroy the entire system at any point of time. And while Linux or Windows will eventually print out some kind of warning before you do something really crazy, DOS will not. So that's just something to mention. DOS is text-based, text -based, obviously. We don't have any graphical user interface, even though some programs in DOS managed it to uh, have some sense of uh, graphical interface. It is a minimalist OS, which means it is mainly used to boot up your PC and run some programs on it. It also comes with some little tools to uh, handle files and folders, which we are gonna look into later. But it doesn't come with a lot of included software. The whole idea behind DOS was to sell it with the computer and they'll then sell other software to you after that. So it is a pretty basic program and being basic or being a basic program is what makes it so minimalistic and what makes it so radio-like, I would say. DOS is still usable for simple tasks like web processing or playing games. So obviously for retro gamers, you can still play old games on DOS. And sometimes they are even more fun than newer games. And you can still write DOS, you can still use DOS to write a book. So let's say if if, if you were willing to, to write a novel or uh, say your diary, and you don't want to buy a new laptop, you can really use uh, 20 or 30 year old laptop, uh, install FreeDOS on it and use a word processing tool and write a book on it. That's really still possible. So uh, DOS is really some usable thing today. But, and this is my opinion right here, please prove me wrong. DOS is not secure to be used in any type of public network. So even though you can install a browser or an email client on DOS nowadays, as far as I know, nothing of this comes with the encryption that we use nowadays included. So say if, if, if you use a browser on DOS nowadays, you won't be able to run it with SSL probably, at least not out of the box. Same thing applies for emails. And I also wouldn't suggest to uh, put a DOS machine with networking support into a public area. So I wouldn't necessarily join a public network or even give it uh, its own IP address within the internet. I would always put it behind some kind of firewall, or uh, which basically means just to run it in my home network because I think 
even though there's not a lot of functionality or not a lot of components to really break into, I think you shouldn't be typing in too sensible of data into any kind of DOS machine that is able to, to access the internet. It's not the right system to be used with for, for home banking or something like that. There's a there's a good chance that uh, that you data will be opposed to any kind of places you don't want it to be exposed to. But that's just my opinion. And if you know something to secure a DOS system, well, feel free to prove me wrong. But uh, also seeing that uh, that DOS is still a single user system and all that stuff. Um, I wouldn't suggest to rely on the security of DOS nowadays. So let's talk about FreeDOS. FreeDOS is a project founded by Jim Hall. In 1994, he did the first release of FreeDOS, basically when Microsoft was saying that DOS will be killed. And they will just roll out Windows now. He was kind of afraid that uh, he wouldn't be able to use his favorite system anymore. So seeing that the Linux kernel started in 1991 and uh, and the, the, the first Debian uh, distribution went out in 1993, if, if I remember correctly, um, he probably saw that it was possible to roll out a new operating system and an open source version of a new operating system that was based on Unix. So he said to himself, why shouldn't it be possible to do the same thing with DOS? And I think that's kind of his motivation behind um, creating uh, free DOS. Jim Hall explains his whole motivation about creating FreeDOS in an interview on the channel of Brian Landuk. And I'm going to link this video uh, in the video description. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the link to this video in the video description. So uh, please feel free to watch that if you want to know a little bo bit more about Jim Hall and the FreeDOS project and uh, why it was released, why it was founded. Um, FreeDOS is, as kind of mentioned earlier, an open source version similar to DOS. And this is not like a really uh, a good sentence. Uh, well, first of all, I, I wrote an open source version of DOS. But actually, it just is similar to DOS. It, it, uh, FreeDOS has, has its own kernel. If you boot into FreeDOS, though, you will get the same look and feel as you get in MS-DOS and uh, you will uh, be able to use the same commands as you did in MS-DOS. So you probably don't even recognize too big of a difference. But still, FreeDOS comes with its own components. So it's kind of complicated for me if I should say that uh, FreeDOS is based on DOS, or it's similar to DOS, or it is it is DOS. Well, I don't really, I'm not really sure uh, what is the best thing to apply here. But uh, well, yes, we got an open source DOS right there. That's all we we have to remember, I think. It's free of charge, as the name kind of tells you. It is compatible with all software that was able to run on MS-DOS or PC-DOS. Um, so uh, if you want to run legacy software or old games that you own uh, on FreeDOS, that should be possible. It also comes with integrated support for newer features like networking. So if you, if you remember installing drivers or installing features, on MS-DOS, it could have been kind of a pain in the butt back in the days if you wanted to install, say, the mouse drivers and the CD-ROM drivers and the networking support, which, which 
was especially complicated back on old MS-DOS since networking was a kind of a new thing back then and especially the TCP IP stack was kind of a, a new thing back even in the early 90s. That's all that stuff is already installed in FreeDOS. In FreeDOS, you, you, you just have to install a basic, very easy program. And after that, uh, your computer will start up with uh, networking support, for example. Um, all that is included in the FreeDOS ISO file, which we're going to look at later. So we uh, save us from a lot of pain if we want to use FreeDOS rather than an old version of DOS. It also comes with a package manager and lots of integrated software, which is also free and open source. Some of this software that you get with it is similar to GNU Linux component, is similar to GNU Linux. So you might find something like that within FreeDOS. And talking about the integrated software, there's a web browser, there's an email client, there's, there are a lot of games, there's networking support as mentioned, there is sound support, there are programs for using archives, using file archives like uh, zip or 7-zip or something like that. So it already comes with support for a lot of modern things. And that makes it so easy and nice to use even today. Obviously, I'm not suggesting to use FreeDOS as your main system, but still, it's way on the modern side compared to the old DOS, for obvious reasons. FreeDOS, by the way, is still being developed today, and there's still uh, new releases coming coming up and a lot of people are interested in that according to the interview that brian landuke told uh, took with uh, jim hall back in january 19 2017 uh, there are about 100,000 downloads a month so all of people are still using FreeDOS. Eventually, you also know it because it was installed on your computer when you got it. There's uh, some kind of law nowadays uh, which tells computer manufacturers that they are not allowed to roll out a computer without any operating system. So computer manufacturers that uh, don't want to sent you a computer that comes with Windows installed or with some Linux distribution installed, uh, would just install FreeDOS on their new computers because it's just something that you could easily install within seconds almost. And it would almost run on every computer. Now, obviously, if you buy a new laptop, FreeDOS is probably not the thing that you want to run, run on it, but still, uh, they fulfill, the, the, the computer manage, manufacturers fulfill their requirement by uh, using FreeDOS as a basic operating system. So in the future videos of this channel, I will look a little bit at FreeDOS and see how it's going and if it, those videos gain some interest um we'll keep on working on that so thank you a lot for watching this video please stay tuned for more about free dos god bless you and bye